What is up, everybody? Eric here from That's Wrestling. Thanks for tuning in today. I know I said I was going to do this live after Full Gear, but I think because of the current audience size right now, going live isn't really advantageous because nobody's watching it live. So I'm going to probably do these the day after the shows for the most part. And it really kind of helps because I get to hear some other people's opinions and I kind of get to chew on it a little bit instead of doing it right after. If I uh, get a co-host, then I will probably move towards doing them live again uh, after the shows and whatnot. So on that note, I am looking for co-hosts. So if anybody is interested in being a co-host, it can either be for AEW, it can be for New Japan, it can be for both. It can be a once in a while thing. That's fine too. Let me know. Send me an email, eric at thatswrestling.com, and you can, um, yeah, we can uh, see if we can work something out on that. But just having somebody else to banter with will definitely help out on the live shows, and especially right after a show, just kind of having a, a moment to kind of chew on it um, before I kind of give my thoughts on these things as well. So, if you are listening to this as a podcast, you can also find this over on YouTube. You can just search That's Wrestling on YouTube and you'll find it. Also, the link to the channel is in the show notes if you're watching, if you're listening to this on a podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube and would like to get the podcast version of it, you can find it in pretty much all your favorite podcast apps. If you can't find it in your app, Shoot me an email, eric at thatswrestling.com, to let me know which app you can't find it in so I can get it submitted and get it on there. Uh, if you can't find it, though, you can always go to thatswrestling.com and pick up the RSS feed over there and just import it into your podcast app. So, other than that, let's, uh, let's get going here. So, today I'm going to be doing my review and thoughts on AEW Full Gear. I thought this was definitely an excellent show, but let's start off a little bit earlier in the week. So, actually, the day before was AEW Dark this week. So, they actually put AEW Dark up the night before on Friday because the the uh, the, the pay-per-view was the next night. <clears throat> so, I fig- I'm guessing they're going to do this ahead of pay-per-views and put out Dark ahead of time instead of on Tuesdays. So, there won't be an AEW Dark this week on Tuesday. But there wasn't a whole lot on AEW Dark. It really didn't matter at all, and the wrestling was not very good. So, I don't even really need to touch on it at all. Going into the show, a few things just noticing right off the bat. They had a nice custom set, so the set was different from AEW Dynamite. It had a bunch of gears all over the place and uh, you know, just some custom set pieces and whatnot. Excalibur and JR were the announced team. No Tony tonight because he was doing college football. So for the most part, during football season, we will not be seeing Tony on pay-per-views. But I think really it's only going to be this if they're going to go quarterly, it's just going to be probably the, the the one that happens in November because football season will be over by the time the first quarter pay-per-view probably starts. Uh, I'm guessing their next pay-per-view is probably going to be February or maybe the end of January, so it could be touch and go on that one. But he, he has a contract with doing college football, uh, so we might not see him on pay-per-views during football season. So the Pre-show, we had Britt Baker and B Priestley. They showed the video package that Baker did on Dark on Tuesday night. Um, Obviously, that was almost no build at all. So, I don't know why they aren't showing this stuff on Dynamite. Again, they need to... If they're going to build things on Dark, then they need to promote Dark a lot more on dynamite i mean this week there was no mention of dynamite uh, no mention of dark at all on dynamite so they really if they're going to build stuff exclusively over on AEW dark they need to start promoting that show every week on dynamite why are we just seeing this video package for the people who are not watching dark because either they don't know about it which is likely um, 
or they just don't want to watch anything other than the TV show, they're not going to go out to YouTube to hunt down some of this stuff. Why was this, you know, built solely on AEW Dark and then they just put it on here? Obviously, there has been issues with these two, and, and B. Priestley gave Britt Baker a concussion at Fight for the Fallen, but again, no build. I'm guessing this is probably not the end of it because there was very little story of this going in, so I don't know. And why was it put on the pre-show with such little build? There's probably something better that could have gone on the pre-show, um, but I don't know what because out of the matches that were on the card or on the main card, still, eh, they're all right. I, I don't know what would get put down there other than Sean Spears versus Janela, but again... There is basically no build for that match other than a quick thing on Dark and a very quick run-in by Janela on Dynamite this week. So um, really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Anyways, going into this, they actually mentioned that Britt Baker has the flu. So if that is true, man, she uh, definitely is toughing it out to, to do this. Britt Baker, right at the beginning, is really pissed. There's a lot of brawling. B is going after Britt's head. And then uh, B starts working over Britt's back a bit. Kind of wraps her around the post and ropes and, and, and shots to the back. Britt goes for a suplex, but she can't do it because of her back. B hits a roundhouse kick to... Uh, B hits a roundhouse kick to Britt's head while Britt is kneeling. And um, B... Gets her in uh, like another submission, and Britt manages to get to the rope. Goes out to the apron. B hits a double stomp to Britt's back off the top rope while she was standing down on the apron. And then Britt hits a Canadian Destroyer, hits B with a super kick, and then gets Lockjaw for the submission win. The biggest thing coming out of this was after the match, Awesome Kong comes out with Brandy. And then Kong hits B with a back fist. And then Kong has a knife and she hands it over to Brandy. Kong hits B with Angel's wings. And then she gets the knife from Brandy. And Brandy has Kong cut a lock of B's hair. And then she takes it and stuffs it in her belt. So I don't know if she's going to start collecting pieces of hair from the women's division. But we will see. But that is what happened. Uh, then we have, going into the actual main card of Full Gear, we have the Young Bucks versus Proud and Powerful, which is the dumbest name in the world for Santana and Ortiz. I wish they would change that. They show Rock and Roll Express in the front row. The Bucks are, are tagging in and out for a while. Matt does a blind tag and hits Santana with a unexpected spear. Uh, it looked like it <laughs> did not feel very... Got him right in the side. Uh, Proud and Powerful have a few issues with the ref throughout this. They try a tag um, by one of them sticking up their foot, but the ref doesn't allow it. They tag behind the ref's back, and he didn't see it. And then <laughs> the ref ends up getting a ref you suck chant which was pretty funny. So, you know, he's trying to enforce some semblance of rules, but again, since they have had the past six weeks of kind of loose rules and they're kind of clamping down on them now, I guess we will see how that goes. Hopefully, after this, they definitely clamp down on the rules a bit more and kind of let us know what the rules are so we can have a little bit more of an expectation going forward what we're going to be looking at. Uh, Matt goes for a moonsault, but he ends up jumping over the post onto Ortiz on the outside. And then Nick goes for a running kick on Ortiz on the outside, but Ortiz moves and Nick ran, like kicks his shin hard into the ring post. Um, I haven't watched this match back again, so I don't know if he like slapped the ring post as well, but it sounded like he made pretty decent contact with it. Um, Santana throws Matt into the Rock and Roll Express's lap on the outside. Nick is now having issues walking around because of kicking the post. Santana ends up targeting the leg, and then 
Uh, something that I noticed right here was that Ortiz wrestles in toe shoes, which is kind of funny, like vibrant five fingers. Um, Nick keeps trying to get a tag because um, he's the legal man at this point. Gets a desperation super, super kick and then gets the tag. Nick hits three Northern Light suplexes on Santana and then Ortiz runs in and Matt actually hits a double Northern Light suplex on the both of them. Floats over and does a nub- another double Northern Lights suplex on the two of them. Then uh, Proud and Powerful end up turning it around later on. Matt reverses this butt. Uh, so they go for the street sweeper, but Matt... Uh, basically, so I don't know which one it was. I think it was Santana who came off the top. But Matt grabbed onto him and basically turned it into a Spanish fly. It was it was a really cool reversal of that maneuver. Bucks go for Melter Driver, but Nick, with his leg, he can't make the leap up onto the top rope to do the springboard, so he falls down. Matt gets um, posted on the outside, and then, well, so Nick ends up getting tagged in, and uh, gets an awesome comeback with a bunch of kicks, but the pain eventually catches up to him. Matt is on the outside. He gets posted, eats a super kick while he's on the floor, uh, so Mac, Matt is out of it at this point, and then Nick uh, gets hit with Street Sweeper and Proud and Powerful pick up the win. So the match was excellent, definitely a very good opener. Proud and Powerful, um, I'm not sure if they needed the win here. The Bucks have been losing a lot, so I don't know where they're going to go. For those of us who know the Young Bucks, we obviously are, we obviously know that they're very unique and are is an excellent tag team. But I think for people who have only been seeing AEW since Dynamite came on, that we have a lot of new viewers and whatnot and new exposure of the Bucks. And I don't know if they're coming off as anything special to the new audience to the Bucks because they haven't really been presented that way on TV because they have just been kind of losing mostly on TV. And I think most of their wins that they've had have been on AEW Dark. Um, So I'm not sure what they're doing, planning with the Bucks. I mean, we have kind of the same issue with Kenny Omega as well. They, for those of us who have been watching them for a long time, we know they're stars and we know they're excellent. But for new viewers, they haven't been presented as being the cream of the crop type of type of wrestlers. And I don't know if they are just trying to appease or not seem like they are using their pos- position in the company to get ahead. So this is kind of one of those things where I'm not sure if they should have made it public that they are also EVPs with the company and and playing favorites to themselves. And I think they are going a little too far overboard on proving that they're willing to do the job even though they are EVPs, you know, executives in the company and whatnot. But... I guess uh, we will find out in the future if they plan on turning this kind of thing around, and I guess we'll see. Uh, after the match, Proud and Powerful keep beating on the Bucks after the bell, and then um, Sammy Guevara comes down to the ring. He's vlogging the whole time, <laughs> holding his phone out. He uh, brings a loaded sock, but before they can hit Nick, uh, the Rock and Roll Express end up jumping up onto the apron. They low bridge Sammy and Ortiz when they come to attack. And then Ricky Morton does a slingshot Canadian destroyer on Santana. And then the Bucks hold the ropes open and he does a running suicide dive out onto Sammy and Ortiz. This got a massive pop from the crowd, and I was just smiling ear to ear when I saw it happen. It was pre- it was pretty impressive and awesome. I mean, like I, I've said on other shows, I did see Rock and Roll Express uh, with New Japan, and I saw Ricky Morton do a uh, standing hurricanrana in the middle of the ring on Chase Owens at one point. So that 
the, these guys can still go and and Ricky is still willing to do all this crazy stuff at like 63 or something like that. Uh, next up, we had Hangman Page versus Pac. Again, this was an excellent match. This is their second in AEW, I believe, but kind of like their third in a series because they did have that one match over in England. I'm not sure which which uh, federation it was from or what promotion it was from. I think it was for Rev Pro, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Anyways, this is their second meeting in AEW. They uh, show a cowboy cowboy shit sign right <laughs> right before the match starts. Page goes after Pack right away with strikes, sending him to the outside. He works him on the outside, throwing him into the barricade a few times, uh, and then uh, the crowd is really hot into this at the beginning, chanting cowboy shit, and then Pack uh, gets his knees up to block a running shooting star press in the middle and then uh page um well pack ends up rolling to the outside and then page hits a super fast flying you know uh, a fast dive that he likes to do the crowd kind of died off in this match though i've heard reports that the crowd was hot all night from the people who are there so I don't know if it is just the acoustics or how they mic'd it or if they are messing with the levels I did notice during the B and Baker match that the levels of the audience kind of went up and down like in the middle of a cheer so I think they were messing with some of the audio throughout that so I'm not sure if that was part of the issue here is that they kept kind of messing with the audio and brought it too low or anything like that um Page hits a sidewalk slam onto the apron and then uh, throws Pack into the barricade, then hits a moonsault to the floor and throws him back into the ring and hits a running boot for a two count. And then um, something that about that shooting, uh, about that moonsault, I've said it before. I don't know why he's doing these things. He doesn't need to. Actually, JR mentions it too. I mean, he's a big guy. He should be using his power uh, in a match like this. He doesn't need to be doing this moonsault, and especially the moonsault to the floor. One thing I've noticed about a few different people who do this spot, they do this moonsault from the top rope turnbuckle to the floor. When they're climbing the turnbuckle and they get to the top, they never look back to see if the person they're doing the moonsault to is even there. And it completely takes me out of it because they haven't looked back to see if the person is even standing there at all for like a good three to five seconds before they actually do the moonsault. So what idiot would blindly do this move without checking to see if his target was even there? And he's not the only one who does it. And it's really annoying when I see it, um, you know, Charlotte does the same move and she never looks back to see if the people are actually there. And it's just stupid because especially because it takes so long. And then the person down on the floor is just looking like a chump, just standing there watching, waiting for it to happen. Uh, I wish if he did this spot that he would use it more sparingly and use it when it made sense and actually make it make sense by looking back to see if anybody's actually there. Then you could actually do some where he's climbing up, he looks back and his target is gone. So he doesn't do the moonsault and just turns around and does whatever he needs to. Um, instead of look, looking like an idiot, just going up there, looking away the entire time, not knowing if his opponent is actually there to take the moonsault. Um, Hangman sets up for a buckshot lariat, but Pac rolls out of the ring and actually sits on a chair on the outside. Uh, when Page goes to get him, Pac quickly gets up, gives Page a brain buster on the open chair seat. Uh, Page barely answers a 10 count at this point. He's got a huge mark across his back where the edge of the seat hit him in the back. Um, and then Pack goes up to the top rope, but Page wipes out Pack's legs. And Page goes up to the top and gives Pack a fallaway slam from the top rope. Page then goes for a buckshot, but is met with a super kick and then a snap German suplex by Page, uh, by Pack. And then um, 
Paige does a quick spine buster to Pack, and then uh, Hangman gets Pack up for Dead Eyes, but Pack turns it into a brutalizer. Paige starts to fade, but then he falls over into the ropes, so he managed to get to the ropes to break this up, so he obviously can't grab the ropes, he just kind of fell into them. Pack attempts a black arrow, but Paige moves out of the way, and then Paige goes for the buckshot, but Pack actually blocks it, and they do a uh, kind of a standing switch, which then pushes Paige... Uh, t- Pack towards the ref. The ref turns his back, and Pack goes for like a back kick, low blow. But Page man- p- manages to block it, and then he ends up hitting a discus forearm, and then a discus clothesline, and then hits dead eye for the win. So these two are now two and two. I'm mean, sorry, one and one in AEW. Uh, the crowd finally got into it. Uh, in the end of the match, but like I said, they kind of lost them early on after the the opening bit. But again, could be because of how it was mic'd, but I didn't really see much in the crowd, so I don't think this was particularly why it was mic'd. It was a good match, and uh, the end was really good, and the end, end like last four minutes or so really kind of saved this match in the end. Uh, next up, we had Joey Janela versus Sean Spears. We had this it, almost with no build. At the end of AEW Dark on Tuesday, they showed Joey Janela outside smoking a cigarette, and then Tully came up to him and was talking to him for a second, then was attacked by Spears, and it looked like they were going to like rip his tongue out with pliers. I, Other people thought that. I thought what they did because... Sean Spears actually had the cigarette in his hand that he took from Janela. I thought what they were trying to convey was that they were going to grab his tongue with the pliers and then burn the cigarette on his tongue um, because they moved the camera away and you heard Janela kind of screaming. So I don't, obviously it's kind of up to your imagination. That's what I thought at the time when I was seeing that they were going to burn him with a cigarette, um, not rip his tongue out. They were just holding his tongue with the pliers, but you know, other people have thought other things, but that is really all that set this match up. And then Janela had a quick run in at the end of the Brandon Cutler match with Sean Spears on Dynamite just to make the save before Sean Spears did a Death Valley driver on the chair to uh, Brandon Cutler. But really, that was it. That's it for the the build of this match. Janela starts the fight off before even taking his glasses off and his jacket off, um, which is <laughs> pretty funny. Tully keeps making some distractions on the outside. Janela gives Spears a kick on the floor while Janela is on the apron, and then Janela goes for a cross body, but she- Spears turns it into a body slam on the outside, and then Spears pulls Janela to the outside later on, gives him a slam on the apron. Earl Hebner is the referee on this, and I think it's probably time that he needs to retire because he is a bit slow and like Janela had to wave at him to get the hell out of the way for, for a move. And, um, I just think he's not fast enough to stay out of the way. Um, yeah, at this point, um, then at one point, Sean (laughs) Spears uses the tag rope and he ties up Janela's hair with the tag rope. Uh, Janela actually has to end up ripping some hair out to get out of the rope. The crowd is definitely on Janela's side, so at least that's one positive out of this. Janela is the baby face, and Sean Spears is getting the heel heat. Spears rolls to the outside to avoid Janela at one point, but Janela then ends up hitting a cannonball dive from the top rope to the floor. And then back in the ring, Spears hits Janela with... Uh, a suplex um, and then Tully goes up onto the apron to buy Spears some time and um, Janela goes over to the top rope Spears gives Janela a backbreaker across the turnbuckle and then Spears goes across the ring to undo the turnbuckle and while the ref's back is turned because he's putting the turnbuckle pad back Spears gives 
a spike pile driver to Janela on the floor with the assistance of Tully. Tully uh, gets up on the ring steps and when he jumps off the ring steps and push de- pushes down on Janela's feet while Spears gives him the spike pile driver on the floor. So it's nice to see that Tully's actually making a difference now and is actually getting more involved with the matches to help out Spears. Spears rolls Janela back into the ring, gives him a running Death Valley driver, and he picks up the win. Um, Like I said, finally, Tully helps Spears actually win. Uh, For the most part, Tully has been pretty ineffective on being a second or being a heel a a second and actually getting more involved. Then we go to a backstage interview with Kip Sabian, and then Kip Sabian is just spouting off a little bit, talking about, random things and you know trying to be on the right side of stuff but he wasn't getting anywhere so he is now teamed up with penelope ford and they're going to be the super bad squad i guess or something along those lines i didn't know this until i heard it on another place which is kind of nice that i didn't do this live after the show is that kip sabian and penelope ford are dating in real life and Penelope Ford used to date Joey Janela. So at the end of this, um, Penelope Ford said, why, why be bad when you can be super bad? So Kip Sabian, you know, goes by super bad and Joey Janela is the bad boy. So I'm guessing they're going to start in some sort of program with Kip Sabian and Joey Janela and working in this actual real life story with Penelope Ford leaving Joey Janela and now dating uh, Kip Sabian in real life. So I don't know much behind that relationship because I just heard it on um, some other podcast. Um, So I don't know if it was like a bad breakup or anything like that or who knows. I don't know. Uh, Next up, we had the triple threat for the tag championship I'm not sure why they bothered going triple threat on this. Kind of, I guess it worked out in the end on how the finish was. But really, I I think they should have just gone with a simple, you know, tag match instead of this triple threat. Because it is really early. It's the first title defense. And... I think for the most part, keeping AEW a little bit more on the sports side and having a max of two teams or two sides of the, of the, um, of the match. So I'm fine if they want to do three on three matches, four on four matches, stuff like that. Um, but the triple threat is kind of, you know, kind of gimmicky. We don't, I don't think we want to go down this route too much because we don't want what happened in this to to play a part um i guess it's fine in this particular match but when you have matches where the champions lose the championship and they weren't even factored into the fall um i I just kind of hate using the triple threat stipulation to kind of get out of a championship reign that way um so it was nice to see uh, Lucha Bros actually trying to pull the ref before doing illegal stuff. So that was nice. They set up various ways of how to pull the ref. You know, one of them would distract the ref. One of them, uh, there's another time they would, you know, kick one of the teams uh, or somebody who was standing on the outside and that person would get pissed and try to get into the ring, which would then pull the ref so they could do their double team or whatever illegal moves they're doing. So a lot better than has been done. Uh, I hope they definitely kind of reiterate this. If you're going to do illegal stuff uh, on purpose, make sure you work on pulling the ref in the match. So somebody needs to be distracting the ref. So the ref is not seeing this stuff happen a lot better in this match. The match really was who was best at pulling the ref. Um, I like a a couple times throughout this match that a person who was getting beat up and really needed to make a tag started crawling towards their own corner, but their partner 
was taken out, so they couldn't make the tag. So they had to go to the the team who didn't have a a wrestler in the match. So they had to tag in one of them. That actually happened a couple times. Uh, it was very nice to see a nice little piece of psychology. It's like, oh, I want to tag my partner in, but he's not available. But I need to get the hell out of here because I'm gonna. I can't. I can't fight on anymore without risking getting pinned or submitted so i might as well tag in a fresh guy from the other team and hope that you know my team can make some sort of move at at a later later time to 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 finish this match kaz went for another over the top rope rana and uh he this time on penta instead of phoenix like he did a couple you know on dynamite his head hit the floor just like last time, um, but last time it was to the ring apron and he hit his head on the apron. I think he needs to stop doing these, at least to some of these guys, because I believe Penta and Phoenix are a bit smaller than Kaz. Kaz is a pretty big guy, so I think he's just a little too heavy for some of these guys to be able to keep up and... You know the, the the what they need to do, and I think he might be a little bit taller. So really, when he goes over, there's so much weight coming down on these guys' shoulders that I think he slips down too far. So when his feet land over their neck, you know a lot of guys are at least trying to grab the ankle. But I think he's a little too tall for some of these people, and his weight is pulling them, so they're kind of bending at the waist forward, and he just has too much length and hits the hits the ground with his head. He's done it twice. He should probably stop doing that, or he really needs to make a a better effort on getting higher up on the person so they can grab his thighs instead of his ankles so he can be much higher up off the ground but again he's a pretty big guy that's a lot of weight especially how he did this particular one he was on the inside of the ring and then he did the kind of the slingshot jump over the top rope going all the way to the floor that is a ton of weight coming down on pentagon's shoulders or really anybody's shoulders so they're gonna absorb it with their knees a lot so now he's he's the the target is in kind of a crouch position so he's all he's already lost height there and then kaz is so heavy he's probably gonna have to bend at the waist to absorb some more of the weight to slow him down a bit and i just think kaz should probably stop going for these um when he's going to be exerting so much weight on these people it's fine if he wants to go for like a standing hurricanrana because at that point, his weight is already centered below the person's uh, uh, shoulders. But this, if he's fl- coming flying over the top rope and he's g- building up some speed, you know, even if it is five feet, that's a lot of force coming down on the person. But anyways, I went way too long on that. Uh, Kaz ends up hitting a, an insane si- assisted DDT on Phoenix. I have to say throughout this match, Phoenix was amazing. He does so many crazy moves and all these crazy dives and stuff. But uh, in this uh, Private Party goes for gin and juice on Kaz, but Kaz actually holds on to the, the top rope, so they can't fling him off. Scorpio Sky comes in, and then they hit the see you later on Cassidy and pick up the three. Penta grabs a chair and brings it into the ring, and before he can use it, the lights go out. And when the lights come back on, we're suddenly seeing double. There are now pen- two Pentagons in the ring and then the new pentagon hits angel's wings and reveals himself to be christopher daniels so this really made absolutely no sense to me why did christopher daniels bother dressing up like pentagon in the first place so are you you're telling me that christopher daniels took all this time to get dressed up put on makeup and wait for the end of the match to come out and confront Pentagon for giving him a pile driver on the ramp a few weeks ago. Yeah, this makes absolutely no, they should have just gone 
cut out the lights, and then Christopher Daniels shows up in the ring and then attacks Pentagon. It would have been a much better pop instead of seeing suddenly a second Pentagon, which made no sense because it's like, he took all this time to dress up to do this? Why? Why didn't he, or why didn't he just interfere during the match behind the ref's back or something? He could have run out from from through the crowd while Pentagon was on the outside and giving him angel wings on the floor or something. I mean, that would have been way more impactful than coming out dressed as Pentagon and then attacking him while Pentagon was like, who's this dude? Um, yeah. So it was a really weak payoff for this storyline. Um, there, there's so much, there's so many better ways to do this comeback from Daniels and a couple of them, like I just said. So I was really down on this particular, I mean, it's nice to see Daniels come back, but the way they did it was just kind of stupid. Uh, then we had, uh, Emi Sakura, uh, Sakura versus Riho for the women's championship match. Again, another match that had very little story build and, some of it was on Dark and not really mentioned on Dynamite. And yeah, so really this goes... Luckily, Excalibur gave us some stats about how many times these two have uh, wrestled together, how many times they've wrestled one-on-one against each other, how many times they have had title matches against each other, and they're actually 50-50 on title matches against each other, and Sakura has a slight advantage on one-on-one matches over Riho overall, but again, we have that Riho is Sakura's student, she has been her student she was since she was about nine years old. And Riho is actually 22, I believe, where Emi Sakura is 43. So Riho is half her age. Um, Sakura, you know, there's a few times where Sakura, you can't really tell is she doing... She did some heel tactics, but then she does like the We Will Rock You stomp to try to build momentum. So that's kind of more of a baby face thing. And then um, one thing that I hate about her getting the crowd into it, like especially like the We Will Rock You stomp, she just takes so much time that Riho looks so stupid when Riho has been standing in the corner for like, 20 seconds before Sakura runs at her and does a cross body. So Riho just looks like an idiot because she's been standing there for so long and still doesn't move out of the way when she can see the move coming for so long. She could have just, you know, rolled out of the ring or fallen down or something, but it's so dumb. And then same thing, she's just laying there, not making much of an effort to get out of the the surfboard uh, sequence that Sakura does when she's doing the the Deo chants, you know, the, the callback from the audience. It just takes so long. Riho or any other opponent just looks like a schmuck sitting there, not making any attempt to get out. She's not like, you know, trying to wiggle her way out or anything. She's just standing there, sitting there, taking it. Um, when nothing's even happened yet, she's not making any attempt to get out. I just kind of hate these things that Sakura does. To, it just she just takes too much time to deliver a piece of offense and just makes look makes the, her opponent look like an idiot if they don't move out of the way. Um, there are a few times uh, Riho hit. Riho has so many creative ways to get into the double stomp. There is one she did a double stomp onto Sakura on the apron and like crush Sakura down onto the apron with her double stomp. They have a decent striking exchange later on. Uh, The crowd was kind of really in and out of this match. Um, But again, I think it was because they're just taking too much time before these moves with really no reason, no sense of urgency throughout this match. Uh, Riho throughout the match hit a bunch of different stomp variations, like I mentioned, and then they go into a pinning exchange similar to like what happened on their tag match on Dynamite this week. But this time, the final pin attempt, Riho gets the double knees right beforehand and then picks up a pin with a high stack. Riho has retained the women's championship. So my thoughts before this next match... 
Um, are they going to have all the titles be retained because the championship match for the tag titles and the women's title both retained by the current champions. And then we have one more match, which is the Cody Jericho match, which is also for the title. So are we going to have a show where the champions all retain? So going into this, I was really, I had no idea which way it was going to go, but it went how it went. And Cody is insanely over. His crowd pop was insane when he came out. Cody also comes out with MJF as his corner. Jericho comes out with Jake Hager. Uh, people start chanting happy birthday to Chris Jericho, which was pretty funny. Uh, he did not look too happy about that. Uh, Jericho has a custom weight belt on, so mocking uh, Cody, who also wears a weight belt. He has Le Champion written on the back, and then there's some champagne glasses and some champagne bottles. It's pretty funny. Uh, the judges at ringside are announced as Arn Anderson, Dean Malenko, and the great Muda. Uh, so KG Muda, or KG Mudo, um, for those not in the U.S., uh, I think Great Muda is mostly his U.S. name. Uh, there's someone in the sign that says, be careful, Chris Geriatrico, which was pretty funny. Uh, basic wrestling match to begin. Jericho keeps escaping to the outside whenever he's kind of getting in trouble. Cody gets... Uh, out of a waist lock by sending Jericho to the outside and then Cody goes for a dive um, and then Cody starts to work on Jericho's dominant arm trying to neutralize the Judas effect uh, and then Jericho is sent to the outside on the ramp and this is where the match really goes a little off the rails it wasn't supposed to happen Jer uh, Cody ends up going for a dive out towards the ramp but whatever However he dove, he didn't stay flat. He started to tumble forward, and his he took a header right onto the ramp and busted himself open hard way right above the right eye, I believe it was. There was a nice, huge, crescent-shaped gash. Uh, he de like I actually went back to see if he hard way if he um if he gigged himself before taking the dive or after the dive. Nope, he definitely got that hard way. So I don't know if it was a happy accident or he was gonna you know get busted open later in the match anyways. But if he was not planning on getting busted open during this match, this just gave this match a whole new level and uh i'm calling it a happy accident if there wasn't a planned busted open spot um so um don't know where we're going so then we have um, some great improv from Jericho and Hager. Hager tosses a chair into the ring, and it looks like Jericho might use it, but then he sets it up in the ring and sits on it, waiting. The doctor's looking at Cody for a minute, kind of just making sure that he's all right, make sure he doesn't have a concussion or anything like that. Jericho then throws Cody to the outside once he comes back in. Jericho uh, pulls the ref, and Hager attacks Cody, uh, I don't know if Cody was ever supposed to bleed, like I said, but it's working at this point. Uh, Cody goes for a moonsault, but misses. Jericho goes for a lion salt, but Jer uh, Cody gets his knees up, and then K uh, Cody hits a springboard cutter, so the os cutter uh, for the rest of us. Uh, Cody fires up a bit, uh, hitches, hits a bunch of strikes and a disaster kick, but then Jericho turns it around on the outside. Jericho runs Cody... Uh, into the post back first. He's holding uh, Jericho's holding Cody across his chest, so he's actually holding Cody. Runs him into the into the post. Um, Jericho goes over to Cody's mom, who's sitting at ringside, and starts uh, running his mouth at her. Cody's mom actually slaps him and says "f you" to him, um, and then Cody spears Jericho on the outside. Jake Hager gets multiple shots in behind the ref's back. Um, but Aubrey turns around and sees that Cody's been laid out, so she kind of puts two and two together, but she didn't see the strike, so she ends up throwing uh, Jake Hager out. Before he leaves, though, um, 
he ends up getting a, in a little bit of a scuffle with MJF, who had come over to the other star, side and started mocking and waving goodbye and whatnot. Um, so while the ref is dealing with that, Jericho hits Cody with the title belt that Hager had thrown into the ring uh, previously. And then Jericho does the Eddie Guerrero spot where after he hits Cody with the bell, he you know, falls down onto the mat and lays, it looks like he's been laid out himself. So when the, when the ref turns around, both of them are, look like something happened. They're, they're both down. Um, and then when the ref finally turns back around, Jericho makes a slow crawl to the pin and, uh, Cody kicks out at two. Cody then blocks the juice effects, turns it into a crossroads, but Jericho manages to kick out at two. They have a bit of a striking exchange on their knees, and then they're working their way up to their feet. Cody goes for a disaster kick, but uh, Jericho turns it into a code breaker, picks up a two count. Jericho takes off his weight belt and starts whipping whipping Cody, which uh, is right in front of the ref. Aubrey takes the, the... the belt away she lets the match continue since it is the champion i guess i guess i kind of answers it that there is champion's advantage by if he gets dq'd he may lose the match but he still gets to keep the title so it sounds like well since he was the champ the ref is going to allow it to continue because if he gets dq'd he keeps the championship so I guess she erred on the side of let the match continue because it would not help the um, the challenger, though it could set him up for a future match. Um, Joe, uh, Jericho is up on the top rope, uh, and Cody ends up hitting a super kick and but and goes for a Rana off the top, but Jericho actually grabs him and jumps down and turns it into a Walls of Jericho. Sounds like. Um, it sounds like they're not going to be calling it the walls of Jericho. Uh, I haven't heard the announced team say anything like that. They've always used different names like the lion tamer or the Brost and crab or whatever. Um, Jericho moves it back into a really high angle lion tamer. So I, I would normally call like Boston crab when the person, when the opponent is completely facing the other direction through the, um, through the aggressor's legs. Um, and then the lion tamer is kind of when they pull him, pull the guy more into a vertical position and kind of put their leg behind the guy's neck. Um, so that's what Jericho does here. Puts him in a super high angle lion tamer. Uh, MJF is outside with a towel and um, the, the commentary mentions it. It's like, oh man, well, he's holding, was he going to throw in the towel? Jericho gets a few stomps in on Jericho's head. Cody, uh, sorry, on Cody's head. And then Cody looks to be out of it. He's in the line tamer. He's not getting out of it. And then MJF throws in the towel and the match is stopped. Jericho retains. So we have the classic, the corner has thrown in the towel on behalf of the competitor. It didn't look like Cody was going to get out of it. So, you know, I didn't know where this was going to go. Jericho leaves the ring, the inner circle celebrating at the top of the ramp and then or up on the stage and MJF and Cody are now in the ring. Cody kind of seems confused. He seems a little bit out of it. MJF is distraught. It's like he's he's crying, saying that he's sorry. The the crowd chants you effed up. And, um, so, so MJF is kind of like on his knees begging for forgiveness. Cody picks up MJF. Um, Cody seems to accept he's kind of patting him on his shoulder and then MJF kicks Cody right in the balls. So yes, there was a MJF heel turn that ended up happening. It didn't happen in the way a lot of people thought it was going to go, um, you'd think the towel throwing in was going to be the turn. Uh, I don't know why they went this way because I think they should have extended out MJF and Cody a bit longer because it made no sense for MJF threw in the towel and it appeared that Cody was accepting of this. 
he forgave him for doing it or or Cody realized that yeah, he wasn't getting out of the lion tamer, so that it was the only logical thing to do. MJF did the right thing. So, why would MJF who is has this ruse going on and the mark doesn't know? So, Cody doesn't know that MJF is trying to be is trying to subvert Cody in some way. Um, you would think throwing in the towel, but it seemed Cody accepted that that was the right thing to do. So why would you end a ruse when the mark doesn't know? This makes no sense. They could have kept going, and in the in the upcoming weeks, MJF could continue to subvert Cody in various ways and and, and try to make it out. Of course, that could end up making Cody look stupid, but in this case, it looked like Cody accepted. The crowd eventually kind of looked like it had accepted as well, so they could have gone farther because there was no reason to end the ruse when there's nothing at stake anymore and the mark doesn't know. So, anyways, um, after MJF is leaving with Cody laid out in the ring from getting kicked in the balls, he is kind of turns around and is looking at the the ring, and then out of the side, uh, a fan has thrown a drink at MJF. There's a lot of speculation if this is actually a fan, because they did a very good job, but one thing that happened was... Right when I saw it, I'm like, was that a plant or not? But then, after the drink was thrown, the camera went to the crowd where the drink came from. If that was not planned, I don't think the camera would have moved to show the person who threw it. You can see that like security, but it's mostly AEW officials, grabbed the dude Everybody in the the uh, arena says the guy was ejected, but of course that could have just been completely for show. And then later out, it does look like it was a plant. So that one camera move was the only thing that told me this was probably a plant. And when MJF turned around towards the camera, he was smirking. So I think he was expecting it. Um just kind of how, just kind of how it all played out. It just looked too perfect to not be a plant. Um, so it looks like it did. It was a plant by a wrestler named Alan Angels. Uh, I believe that is what's being reported right now. So it ended up it was a plant and wasn't just a a rogue fan. Though, if it was a rogue fan, that MJF had a lot of heat after kicking Cody in the balls. So. Last up, we have what ended up being a very controversial match, and I'll talk about it a bit at the end, but it is Kenny Omega versus John Moxley in a lights-out match. One thing that I noticed, the ref was checking Omega for checking his gear for weapons, but this is an unsanctioned match, so why did he bother checking it? Maybe it's just out of habit, but I thought it was pretty funny. Um... JR throughout this match was kind of up and down, but he really got behind some of the stuff. And um, I think, I think his kind of grumpiness or kind of um, I won't say grumpiness, but I can't think of another word to describe uh, his indignation about what was going on. They start brawling right out of the gate. Uh, Moxley goes to the outside, grabs a trash can, and he says into the camera, you want unsanctionable? Well, we're going to see some effing garbage wrestling or something along those lines. Uh, Moxley gets in a few F-bombs throughout this match into the camera, and uh, they start brawling, um, and then Mox hits Omega over the head with the trash can lid. They fight to the outside. Omega throws Moxley over the barricade. Moxley lands in a in a folding chair that's on the outside, and then Omega just like gets a whole head of steam and does a running drop kick over the barricade and drop kicking Moxley right in the chest on the outside. They fight into the crowd a bit. 
Omega clocks Moxley with a few beers that he's taken from fans. Uh, he ends up hitting him with a regular, uh, tra- you know, p- big plastic square trash can on the outside. He does a double stomp off the balcony onto the trash can that Mo- is on top of Mox. They fight their way back to the ring. Moxley gets a barbed wire baseball bat and hits Omega across the back a few times. And he just starts bleeding immediately from the punctures on his back. And then he sets it up. He actually does a stomp onto the baseball bat onto the back. Uh, the cha- the crowd chants, you sick F. And then Kenny goes for a snapdragon, and, but uh, Mox ends up using the barbed wire to rake across a Kenny's arm. So he gets out of the snapdragon suplex. And then... Uh, Kenny ends up hitting Mox with the trash can that was in the ring. Um, and then he does a pile driver onto the trash can. Moxley goes to the outside and sets up a table, kind of leaning up against a barricade. He grabs a barbed wire broom from under the ring. And then uh, Mox goes for a dive, but Kenny hits Moxley with the broom, cuts him open pretty bad, actually. Kind of looked like it wrapped around the back of his head a little bit. So he had a nice big gash on the back of his head. He was bleeding pretty good. Um, And then he does a double stomp onto the broom on Moxley's back. And uh, Moxley's, you know, all cut open on the back. And then... Omega grabs another trash can and then sets it up over the corner post. He does the you can't can't escape, and when he goes for the moonsault, he grabs the trash can and puts it between him and Moxley when he lands. And then Omega goes to the outside and grabs a board covered in mouse traps. He puts it into the middle of the ring. Moxley then goes to the outside, grabs a bunch of chain, so... The, the funny little joke there where uh, Omega had said in the in the promo leading up to this what are you what are we gonna chain wrestle so he brings in these chains they they look like they might be brass um, instead of steel because they're kind of this gold color um, could be brass it could just be plated steel or something like that um, if they were brass I think brass is a little bit lighter then steel so it could be a little safer to use especially if you're swinging at somebody or something like that um i'm pretty sure brass is lighter than steel by a decent amount uh and then we have the oh and then uh, uh omega uh gets sidewalk slammed into the pile of chains that moxley had laid out on the ground um and then he does a neck breaker on the chains and then um, Moxley starts choking Omega with the chains and Omega gets out by hitting him with a trash can lid. Uh, Moxley goes back to the outside, grabs an ice pick and, uh, Omega's leaned up against the corner. He ends up stabbing it into the top turnbuckle and leaving it there for a while. JR is kind of losing it at this point. Um, <laughs> he is just, um, uh, uh, I don't know best way to say it again from the last time. I guess he's just showing his contempt sort of for what's going on. He's kind of losing his mind at this point. Uh, Moxley gives Omega a suplex into um, into the chains and then wraps a chain around Omega's neck. But then Omega hits three snapdragons and then Moxley is sent out over the top rope with the chain around his neck. Um, so he's kind of hanging there a little bit. And then Omega goes for a ride of the rise of the Terminator and sends himself and Moxley through the table on the outside that he had set up earlier. And then Omega goes to the other side of the ring and pulls out a bag from underneath the ring and it's broken glass. And he pours it all over the ring, gives Moxley a spine buster on the glass, and then he drags him back first through the glass. And then Omega puts him in a sharpshooter, and Moxley wants to get to the ropes to try to, you know, give it, get himself some leverage to get out. But there's the pile of glass is the shortest route, so he crawls through the glass. Um, to get out, Omega then actually feeds some glass to Moxley. Moxley gets uh, gives 
Omega a suplex on the glass, and then Omega hits a couple V triggers. Um, and then Omega gra- grabs the ice pick out of the turnbuckle while Moxley is crawling away up the ramp. He starts kind of stabbing uh, Moxley's head a little bit. And then uh, Omega yells to the Young Bucks and Paige, bring it, bring it out. And then they don't want to do whatever Omega's asking him to do. But then they head to the back and bring out this massive web of barbed wire. They fight a bit and then Moxley gets uh, Omega and then gives him a suplex into the massive web of barbed wire. Uh, A bunch of people have to help them out of the barbed wire. And then Moxley gets hit uh, with a V-trigger, sending him through this uh, uh, backlit prop of the Full Gear logo and everything like that. Um, And then eventually they make their way back to the ring. Moxley gives... A quick paradigm shift on the glass, but Omega kicks out, and then Moxley rolls to the outside. He grabs a box cutter, and he starts cutting all the tie-downs for the canvas, and he pulls back the canvas and all the paddings, padding exposing the boards below. Moxley goes for a pile driver, but Omega backdrops Moxley onto the boards. He gives Moxley a V-trigger, and then tries to go for the one-wing angel, but Moxley gets out of it, and then... Um, Omega hits Moxley with a paradigm shift. He only gets a two count. So uh, Omega goes up to the top rope and he goes for a Phoenix splash, but he ends up crashing onto the boards. Moxley covers uh, Omega and gets a two count. And then Moxley picks up Omega, gives him an elevated paradigm shift on the boards and picks up the three. So uh, afterwards, uh, Moxley is speaking into the camera, so he says, So what is it? Five, four, five, four? How does that work? And then F you, that's how it works. And then um, later on he says, You get what you pay for, mother effers. Uh, and then the show goes off the air. So this final match definitely has been uh, a bit uh, controversial, I bet. guess is the best way to say it. A lot of people hated it. A lot of people liked it. It seems that the majority is on the like side, but there are uh, there are there are plenty of detractors out there as well. Personally, I thought this match was pretty awesome, though I like this kind of style of wrestling. Um, I do like the garbage wrestling. I'll watch it. Um, but I thought this was a little better than your standard garbage wrestling match. Yeah, this was kind of all right. You do this to me, I'll do this to you. You do this to me, I'll do this to you. But it did have a much better flow than a lot of like CZW matches or stuff like that. But I think what was really smart was they had a few real props and then had some gimmicked props. So like the bed of barbed wire was not real barbed wire. It's definitely a gimmick um, thing of barbed wire because they were not cut up nearly as bad as they would have been if it was real barbed wire. Um, but the baseball bat with the barbed wire and the broom with the barbed wire was real. So they kind of set it up in the... It was a nice little bit of trickery by setting it up in the people's minds that they have real barbed wire on those bat on that bat and broom because when they got hit they sudden they started bleeding immediately so it's nice a little bit of trickery to set it up being like oh they're using real barbed wire so you wouldn't think that the gimmicked barbed wire you know bed of barbed wire was real barbed wire uh, and even if it wasn't you could still suspend your disbelief because of what you saw earlier um one thing that is a little weird, um, some people are complaining about, okay, so Omega went out of his way to build this thing, not knowing if it would ever actually get used, blah 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 But, you know, Omega is a EVP. He could have easily commissioned somebody, hey, I got this idea for this thing. Why don't you make it for me? Leave it backstage, blah blah blah. Or hey, I got this idea. Let's let's stick down a whole bunch of mouse traps on this board and stick it under the ring. Um, I mean, these are things that he could easily have commissioned uh, ahead of time, and it wouldn't. It doesn't. It didn't throw me off uh, with this thing. These things existing because they. He knew ahead of time they were having this match, so he might as well make these weird contraptions anyways. Um, so I, I didn't have a problem with it. I mean, they obviously 
when you have this type of match, both competitors are going to be stashing various things under the ring because they, you know, it's unsanctioned, so they're going to hide stuff under the ring to use on the other person. And this was just kind of another thing that Omega could have been either hiding or made openly, and 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 I don't have any problem with it. Um, another thing, uh, definitely like the glass um, was not real. Maybe one piece was real, um, but for the most part, it was not. There was it was definitely sugar glass because it definitely broke down into m- tiny pieces of powder, um, which normal glass would not break into that type of powder that quickly. Um, so and there's some nice selling though with the ref because during one of the counts after the kick out, he was shaking his hand and it looked like he was pulling a piece of glass out of his hand. So it was a nice little, it was a nice little thing from the ref to, to play up that, you know, even he got stabbed with a piece of glass or something like that. Um, even though it, it was most definitely sugar glass and that's the way to do it. But again, if you have one little piece of real glass that you can maybe cut the guy with, and then the rest of it's all gimmicked, then you know it's 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 obviously a bit safer than than having using real glass for this type of thing, and you can sell the effect um, by using a little bit of real barbed wire, little piece of glass, um, versus some gimmick stuff. The rest of it being sugar glass and not real barbed wire for the barbed wire bed. Um, all in all, I like this match. Meltzer and Alvarez were definitely not happy with this match. It's it's really been a mixed bag as far as the the regular commentators go uh, out there. But overall, um, for various polls, this match was uh, definitely majority were good on this match. I didn't have any problem with this match. I thought it was a good match. I thought it was fun. Um, but again, I like this kind of wrestling. But it is what it is. Um, so overall. I thought this pay-per-view was an excellent pay-per-view. Very fun. The The matches were good. There weren't like any super duds. I think the worst match was really kind of that pre so match. Um, <clears throat> and um, I don't know on the main card what the least favorite was. Uh, probably Janela Janelle Spears. Um but again, they were all good matches. By no way was there a bad match. So I was happy with this. Definitely worth the money for it. And if they are going to continue and they're just going to do quarterly pay-per-views and they're going to deliver like this, the main card was three and a half, three forty or so. So it was, it was shy of four hours. But I mean, you get what you pay for. I thought this was definitely worth the money. If they're only going to do these things quarterly, you're looking at about two hundred bucks a year for 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 pay-per-views for AEW. Hopefully AEW does get bigger, starts getting a bigger fan base and a lot of people can, you know, have watch parties like you know, I like I used to do when I was a teenager. I'd have, you know, three friends come over and we'd split the cost of like the WWF pay-per-view or whatever. So, you know, splitting it is, you know, we all paid 12.50 or whatever instead of paying the whole 50 bucks by ourselves. So, all in all, Excellent pay-per-view, big fan. Uh, like I said at the beginning of this thing, I'm probably going to start. I'm I'm not going to be doing these things live anymore. the The audience just isn't there right now. Uh, if the audience grows to the point where there would be at least a decent live audience, then uh, I I'll, I'll reconsider at that point. Uh, I I have liked being able to sit on these a little bit, kind of kind of digest what happened and, and, and hear some other thoughts and see where I can go with this. Um, but yeah. Um, if you are interested in being a co-host, I am looking for a co-host. So if you're interested in being an AEW co-host, a new Japan co-host or both, or just a once in a while type of co-host, uh, let me know. Shoot me an email, eric at thatswrestling.com. You can also find the RSS feed over there if you cannot find it in your podcast app of choice. And if you can't find it in your podcast podcast app of choice, shoot me an email to let me know which one it is so I can get it submitted and get it on there. If you want to get a hold of me for any comments, questions, feedback, discussion topics you'd like to hear about, 
You can do that, Eric, at that's wrestling.com. You can also find me over on Twitter, that's wrestling one with the number one, that's wrestling one. If you are listening to this as a podcast, you can also find this on YouTube. The channel is just called That's Wrestling. The link is also in the show notes. If you're watching this on YouTube, it is available in podcasts. Like I mentioned, just search for That's Wrestling and you will find it. So thanks for tuning in, everybody, for this review of AEW Full Gear. I will see you again after AEW Dynamite this week. I am also going to watch the San Jose show for New Japan. So look for that coming in the near future. So thanks a lot, everybody. And I will see you next time on That's Wrestling. See you later, guys.